Good morning, everyone. Um, we are going to go ahead and get started. It's exactly 10 o'clock on my computer. Um, we are really excited to host this OPDAC meeting today. Um, this meeting is going to focus on the opioid settlement funds, share available resources to implement settlement strategies, describe some counties' planning process, and brainstorm how partners, especially those with lived experience, can be part of the process. We have a lot of exciting speakers here um, and presenters and a lot of great minds that have helped plan and put together this meeting. And so we're really excited for everyone to join and wanted to go ahead and get started. Um, to get us going, um, we have two ways to let us know who you are. Um, one, we'll have a poll question pop up on the screen um, where you can know who you are and what organization best fits um, where you work. Um, or another option, if you're having any issues with the poll, is just putting your name in that category um, that best fits your work organization in the chat box. So we'll wait about a minute or two to give you a chance to put in a response to the type of work um, that you participate in. I see a couple of notes on audio being a little scattered, so I'm going to try to switch to headphones while y'all um, fill out the poll. Okay, I think our poll results are in and hopefully y'all are able to hear me a little bit better. Um, please let me know if it's worse. Um, we have a lot of folks representing public health today. We have folks also representing harm reduction, substance use treatment, and uh, academia. A few folks um, representing recovery organization, law enforcement or corrections. Um, another type of healthcare provider or clinician and then several folks listed other that they put in the chat. Um, and so we have a good range of folks represented and we're really excited to have everyone. A few quick housekeeping items. Um, for questions during the meeting, um, you're welcome to just use the chat box to put in any thoughts or questions you have. The chat is going to be monitored during uh, the meeting all throughout. Um, Note that to make sure your messages get to everyone, you might need to double check what your drop, drop down menu is defaulting to and make sure you select all panelists and all attendees um, to make sure that we don't miss your message. Um, and if you would like to ask a question to a specific presenter, just include their name um, in your question so we know who to direct the question to. Um, and of course, we'll try to get to as many questions as we can as time allows, um, but we may not get to everyone, um, but we'll do the best that we can. Um, in addition, this meeting is being recorded. Um, the agenda and PowerPoint slides um, will be added online to the NCDHHS um, OPDAC website. And it, the, once it's up, we'll be also sending an email to everyone who registered and everyone who's on the OPDAC list there so that you're aware when everything's available. Hey, Amy, it's Steve. Let me ask you a quick question. I've got a text from a couple of folks who thought they were registered but weren't registered and wanted to hop on at the last minute. Is What is the best way to accomplish that? Is it possible to send me a link I could send them or would they register or... Uh, hey, Sarah, could you email that to me so I could forward it? Thanks. Perfect. And yes, everyone, um, if other people in your networks um, are trying to join as well, you're welcome to share that direct Zoom link that Sarah just put in the chat. Um, I believe it was just sent to host and panelists. So Sarah, if you don't mind sending it to everyone just in case other folks are helping. Thank you. And I think we are good for our next slide. Thank you. So now our next portion is a briefing on the opioid settlement itself by Attorney General Josh Stein and Steve Mange. 
I will be queuing up um, the first portion for Attorney General Josh Stein. He has some pre-recorded remarks that he'll be offering to provide an overview of the opioid settlements. His senior policy counsel, Steve Mange, will follow up with some additional detail. Attorney General Stein was sworn in for the first time as North Carolina's 50th Attorney General in 2017 and his second term in 2021. Attorney General Stein has made, uh, sorry, excuse me. Attorney General Stein has made addressing the opioid epidemic a top priority. His office drafted the STOP Act to reduce the number of people who became addicted to opioids through smarter prescribing practices. The HOPE Act, which gave law enforcement additional tools to stop the flow of prescription pain pills into the drug trade, and the Synthetic Opioid Control Act to drastically reduce the trafficking of illicit fentanyl. He has played a leading role in national efforts to hold drug companies accountable for their role in creating and fueling the opioid epidemic. Hello everyone, I'm Attorney General Josh Stein. Along with my colleagues at the Department of Health and Human Services, I'm excited to welcome you to this meeting of the Opioid and Prescription Drug Abuse Advisory Committee. You all know well how COVID-19 and the challenges of the past nearly two years, job loss, anxiety, depression, have led to a worsening of the opioid epidemic and a spiking of overdose deaths. Now, more than ever, we need treatment and recovery resources to help people struggling with opioid addiction in North Carolina. Over the past several years, I've been working to hold accountable the drug companies that helped to create and fuel this crisis. In July, I led a group of states to reach a historic $26 billion bipartisan multi-state agreement with Johnson & Johnson and the three major drug distributors. We also helped to negotiate an eight to $10 billion bankruptcy plan with Purdue Pharma and the Sackler family. Additionally, we secured 600 million from McKinsey Consultant for advising Purdue Pharma on how to turbocharge its sales of OxyContin. All in, North Carolina is poised to receive nearly $900 million for treatment, prevention, and harm reduction services over the next 18 years, with a large percentage coming in the first few years. This money gives us a once in a lifetime opportunity to turn the tide on this epidemic. And I'm grateful that we have so many local programs already working to help struggling North Carolinians. In the coming months, I look forward to shining a spotlight on their successes, how they are saving lives and helping people heal, and how they are examples for others to see, particularly as we think of how to best use opioid settlement funds. We need to work together to make sure these funds go to actually help people in every one of our 100 counties. My policy director, Steve Mange, is up next to tell you more about effective partnerships, the agreements that will help oversee how the money is spent in North Carolina, and the urgency that all local governments join the agreement now. I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank you, more importantly, for your dedication to fighting the opioid crisis and helping North Carolinians lead healthier lives. We didn't get into this crisis overnight. And after years of hard work, we know we will not get out of, it, out of it overnight either. But we have an incredible opportunity to make a real difference if we work together. And that is one of the fundamental premises of OPDAC meetings, to foster effective partnerships and create a collaborative spirit. The Department of Justice and I are committed to working arm in arm with you all as we continue this fight and build a North Carolina that is safer, stronger, and healthier for all. Thank you. I think it's my turn, right, Amy? You're Wonderful. up, Steve, yep. All right, well, thanks so much. Um, we have, I think, close to 500 people joining us today, which is a real testament both to the organizational skills of DHHS in putting these meetings together and getting the word out and also to the level of interest in this particular topic. So I'm just delighted to be a part of this program today and to share some basic background about the opioid settlements. And I thought I would start with this first slide 
Um, just to give folks a little bit of the lay of the land, because this is some very complicated litigation, both in terms of the range of plaintiffs and the range of defendants and the range of claims. And so what you see here is a chart. Um, there's three columns, manufacturers, distributors, and pharmacy chains, and those are the different defendants involved in the litigation. And this first row you see filed for bankruptcy indicates that um, some companies, because of the weight of the litigation, have act, are now in bankruptcy, and that puts them in bankruptcy court, um, which is its own kind of animal. And of course, the key uh, party here is Purdue Pharma, um, and so they're in bankruptcy. The second line you see that's highlighted in red, this is um, what we'll be talking about a lot today, which is kind of the big settlement involving the big three drug distributors, as well as the drug maker Johnson & Johnson, uh, which owns a subsidiary Janssen Pharmaceuticals involved in manufacturing opioids. And this is the $26 billion settlement that we'll be talking about quite a bit. And the point of the bottom row is really just to remind everybody that even with the resolution of the Purdue Pharmacy, uh, the Purdue Pharma bankruptcy um, and this national settlement, there's still ongoing litigation against some opioid makers, as well as in particular, the various pharmacy chains that you see listed there. Um, and so the litigation will continue even beyond the settlements that we're talking about today. Next slide, please. So if you take together the big settlement I mentioned with the drug distributors and Johnson & Johnson, and you add the Purdue um, bankruptcy resolution on top of that, we're anticipating um, over $30 billion over the course of 18 years um, in opioid settlement funds coming down to the states and territories. What that means for North Carolina is potentially as much as $850 million spread out over 18 years um, with a certain amount of that front loaded in the early three or four, uh, the, the first three or four years of the settlements. Um, one thing I wanna note about that is um, there's some fairly draconian participation requirements in the uh, distributor settlements. Basically the distributors are trying to get as many states and local governments swept into the settlement as possible. And so um, the amount coming to North Carolina de depends in very significant part in getting not just the state, but all 100 counties and all of the large and medium municipalities to sign on to the settlement. If all of that happens, we get as much as 850 million over 18 years. Next slide, please. So what happens to that money? Um, we spent many, many months working with the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners um, and a group they put together called the 555 Committee, five commissioners, five attorneys, and five managers to hammer out a memorandum of understanding about how the settlement funds would flow in North Carolina. And I do want to really sincerely thank the Association of County Commissioners, uh, Kevin Leonard, their executive director, Amy Basin, deputy director, uh, Sarah McGilsky, communications, uh, Jasmine Beach Ferrara, who's on the program with us today, one of the 555 committee members, um, and all the other folks at the county commissioners who helped work out this arrangement, which is in many respects, I think one of the best designed MOA, uh, memorandums of agreement in the country. And so what we worked out is that as this money comes in over the course of 18 years, 15% of it will go to the state um, for the General Assembly to allocate. And 85% of it will go to local governments, um, including all 100 counties, plus 17 of, of the largest municipalities. Next slide, please. Um, one of the exciting things, both about the national settlement and about the North Carolina MOA, is that the, uh, both the national settlement and the MOA direct um, the overwhelming majority of the funds coming down to addressing the opioid epidemic. And this addresses really a central critique of the tobacco settlement, which was that very little of the money went to actually 
addressing um, smoking and uh, all of the public health harms associated with smoking. And so there was a really um, very self-conscious effort on the part of all the parties to make sure we didn't repeat that with the opioid settlement. And so under the MOA, um, a, uh, this is simplifying a little bit, but there's essentially for all the local governments, two options, option A and option B. And under option A, local governments are allowed to select from a range of um, evidence-based strategies that you see listed here. Um, and um, I really want to credit um, DHHS for helping us develop this list, in particular, um, Elise Powell, the state opioid director, who uh, really has worked with us over the last two years to make this MOA as strong as it is. Um, but you see here that these are really bread and butter strategies. They come straight out of the opioid and substance use action plan that DHHS has worked on over the past five years as well as the menu of local options that's part of the action plan. Next slide, please. There is a second option on the local use of settlement funds. And this, this is an option uh, that kind of has two parts to it. Th this option B opens up a wider range of strategies for local governments to consider. There's actually, as part of the national settlement, about a 15-page um, strategy list. And in order to sort of go beyond the option A strategies, option B provides for a collaborative strategic planning process with some of the engaging diverse stakeholders, looking at data, looking at root causes and so forth. Um, and so that is kind of a second option that counties and municipalities can use either separate from option A, or you could actually do both option A and option B. And furthermore, you could do you know, one thing one year and something else the next year. Next slide, please. Another thing we're really proud of about the MOA is the level of transparency and accountability that comes along with these settlement funds. And I, and I think this is unprecedented in the country. I'm not aware of any other state agreement that provides for this level of transparency and accountability. And so folks need to understand that before a local government can even get any settlement funds. They need to set up um, a special, something called a special revenue fund where the funds are segregated and audited at the local level. And even before any money is spent, there's going to be information provided by counties and municipalities that it's going to go on a statewide opioid dashboard that you're going to hear more about today. Um, that would include, if there, if there was an option B planning process, it would include a report and recommendations coming out of that process. Um, in every case, um, there is going to be required a very specific budget item or separate resolution ahead of, the, ahead of any spending, explaining that this is money in the special revenue fund that's devoted to opioid remediation strategies and a certain amount of money will be spent on a certain strategy over a certain period of time. And then after the fact, folks are going to be able to see on this statewide dashboard both annual financial reports and annual impact reports um, from each of those 100 counties and 17 municipalities. So th there isn't going to be any mystery about how the money is being spent or how the money was spent. Um, and so that's something, as I said, we're quite proud of. Next slide, please. I also want to talk a little bit, I've been talking a lot about the rules, which is the MOA, these rules about how local governments can spend opioid settlement funds. But I also want to talk a lot about resources. And I think really today's discussion, today's OPDEC meeting, is the beginning of an 18-year conversation that, it, that is really not just saying to these local governments, you know, here's what you must do, but rather, you know, we are here to help. And so I think you're going to see some of that in today's meeting, and this is going to be a discussion that's going to go on for 18 years, providing resources, information, model programs, essentially making sure that uh, all of our local governments that really want to do the right thing have the resources. Next slide, please. And in this context, I did want to follow up on something the Attorney General talked about in his remarks. And that is this idea of shining a spotlight 
on evidence-based local programs. Because the fact of the matter is, for all those option A strategies that we talked about, there are fantastic programs out there at the local level. And we think a really good way to inspire all of our local governments to adopt effective, impactful programs is to hold up and shine a spotlight on those programs that are already working. And so we may be trying to do that in a thematic sort of way where we stress some of those great programs, some of the planning efforts, perhaps in January of 2022, then maybe treatment, recovery, harm reduction. This is very much a discussion and a work in progress, um, but that's something we're really looking forward to. Next slide, please. And so I've noticed some of the questions that we've seen in the chat have to do with how folks can get information, how they can get copies of things. Um, and so I would um, direct folks, uh, among other resources, to the more powerful NC um, website that the Attorney General's Office has put together, and then click on Opioid Settlements. And there you can get all sorts of information, both about the national settlements, about the MOA, about the sign-on process. And there's two other websites, and these are on the bottom of the agenda that um, Sarah Smith sent out. One is the um, website that um, the folks at the Injury Prevention Research Center are going to talk about. Another is the county commissioner's website. And of course, um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention kind of the bedrock source of a lot of this information, which is uh, the DHHS website, including the statewide opioid and substance use action plan. In closing, um, since we're coming up on a presentation about the dashboard, um, I did wanna just say uh, a big thanks to DHHS and some of our other partners for the tremendous partnerships that I think you're gonna see reflected in today's presentations. And so I already mentioned the just phenomenal partnership with DHHS that we've had over the last five years. I mentioned Elise, we've also worked with Didi Severino and her team at the Division of Mental Health. And of course, Amy Patel, Alyssa Kitless, Sarah Smith, and a very long list of other folks at the Division of Public Health. And we're so grateful for that. And as we do turn over the um, agenda to, uh, to talk about the dashboard, I also wanted to recognize uh, the partnership we've had with the Injury Prevention Research Center at UNC to develop this dashboard, including Steve Marshall, Natalie Blackburn, Catherine Gora Combs, Mike Fliss, uh, Joe San Robinson. Um, we also had help from April Bragg and Chase Holloman. And I also wanted to recognize, uh, last but not least, the Duke Energy Foundation. We actually had a $100,000 grant from the Duke Energy Foundation to the Governor's Institute, which was then passed along to the Injury Prevention Research Center to support the development of the dashboard. So we're incredibly grateful for that generous contribution. And so the point of all these remarks, I think, is that it, it, it takes a village to raise an opioid settlement. And I think we're gonna see that a lot more in the coming months and years. And so with all of that said, it's my great pleasure to turn the agenda over to uh, Natalie Blackburn, who is a public health scientist and all around great person at the Injury Prevention Research Center. Natalie, the floor is yours. Thanks, Steve. Um, so we can go to the next slide. And I will um, kick things off and then I'll turn things over to Amy Patel um, to talk a little bit more about the resources. But first I wanted to say thank you for having me. Um, again, my name is Natalie Blackburn. I use she, her pronouns and I work at the UNC Injury Prevention Research Center. Uh, next slide. And I'm going to be talking about ncopioidsettlement.org today. Uh, next slide, please. For those of you who may not be familiar with the Injury Prevention Research Center, um, we are in Chapel Hill. We develop, test, and implement um, prevention solutions to reduce the impact of injury and violence in North Carolina and around the world. We have 26 staff, 19 principal investigators, and 20 graduate students here. 
um, with strong links to practitioner and harm reduction communities, including those at um, the Division of Public Health, Injury and Violence Prevention Branch. Uh, the Injury Prevention Research Center is made up of three cores, uh, research, outreach, training, and education. Uh, next slide. So ncopioidsettlement.org. Uh, the purpose, and, and Steve mentioned a few of these items, but I'll go into a little bit more detail. Uh, the purpose of this site is to support the information reporting needs of local counties and municipalities, as well as help inform selection of local strategies from option A and option B of the memorandum of agreement uh, to mitigate opioid harms um, in their localities supported by these settlement funds. We also aim with the site to monitor expenditures and document the impacts of how funds are spent statewide, um, promoting transparency and accountability, as Steve mentioned, and assist in disseminating best practices, collaboration between counties, um, municipalities, and uh, their peers. Next slide. So the audience for this site, um, those of you who are engaged in the planning process, designated leaders in, in localities and those in community-based and grassroots groups. Next slide. So the site went live this week, ncopioidsettlement.org. There you'll find uh, resources for um, best practices that align with existing state initiatives, as well as some trainings and webinars to support um, counties and cities. We, there's also provided some opportunities to facilitate planning. So um, existing resources that provide some data for localities um, and guidance on selecting impact measures, um, how to measure the impact of, of strategies selected and help counties and cities understand and evaluate um, what strategy from option A or option B um, that the counties choose to undertake that's really specific to their local context and needs and communities. Next slide. Uh, future functions of the site. As Steve mentioned a little bit about what will become available. This includes um, a warehouse where reporting on the local planning process, as well as the resolutions or uh, budgets as required by the memorandum of agreement. And the place in which annual reporting will be um, submitted and housed including uh, budget information, the annual financial reports and annual impact reports as required um, in the memorandum of agreement. Next slide. So if you haven't got done so already, I encourage you to go to ncopioidsettlement.org. Um, this is what the homepage looks like. And um, we're actually gonna walk through a little bit of the site. You can go to the next slide, um, but just as a, Encouragement, you can click across the top to these different tabs and it'll take you to more information about each of those respective pieces. Um, and now I'm gonna actually ask Amy to share her screen um, so we can tell you, we can actually walk you through the site a little bit more and uh, detail a little bit more about the resources being made available this week. So here on the home page, you'll find that there's some links to um, more about the settlements as Steve Mange described, provided by the Attorney General's office, as well as a wealth of information as provided by um, the Divi uh, Division of Public Health and Injury Violence Prevention Branch. There's um, opportunities to review other sites like morepowerful.org so that folks can uh, learn more about this settlement process, as Steve mentioned as at the end of his presentation with the links. If you click on about the opioid settlements, you'll get a little bit more detail about specifics about the process of how these settlements came to be. Um, and if your county or locality has not signed on, also information about how you may do so to join the agreement um, and the ways in which you can get involved. And then as Steve also mentioned, the breakdowns of how settlement funds are being extended and details about the memorandum of agreement, as well as links for additional information. I will let Amy talk about resources, but on the next tab, you'll see um, a place that is coming soon where we will provide more information about 
um, how funds are being expended, the reporting that is required for counties and municipalities, and ways in which um, we can further facilitate uh, counties in, in their spending of settlement funds. And lastly, there is a, a place for um, some of the partners that we've worked with on this site and which Steve has already mentioned as well. So I will thank all of them for supporting us in this work. So now I'll actually let Amy, um, given our strong relationship with the um, Injury and Violence Prevention Branch, they provided these resources and I will let Amy talk through those and what's been provided. But thank you all for your time today and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Natalie. Yeah, so with the full Department of Health and Human Services, we kind of co coordinated and collaborated to get a wide range of resources put together that is structured around um, the different strategies in the MOA. Um, so on this resources tab, you'll see a brief description of what's under option A and option B, um, as well as again, some of the same links that were mentioned earlier, just to make sure everyone um, is aware of, of these resources and doesn't miss them. Um, so here under option A resources, you'll see this outline of each of the numbered strategies one through 12 um, and corresponding resources that are under each of them. Um, I'm just gonna quickly highlight a couple of them just to show the layout. So for example, strategy nine on certain service programs, you'll see a brief description of what the strategy is itself. And this language is based largely on what is in the MOA itself. Um, you'll see a brief description of why that particular strategy is important. Um, and then here is where you see the main links for the different resources. Um, and each of these blocks will uh, click out directly to that resource. Um, last but not least on the resource strategy page, there is specific contact information that is relevant for that particular strategy. Um, so that if you'd like more guidance on how to go about doing work for that strategy, you have a specific uh, contact email address listed um, on that. And if you have broader questions, we still have um, these couple email addresses at the bottom of each website too. Um, <clears throat> I recognize I went through that quickly, so I wanna show another strategy, highlight um, the layout once more. So for example, strategy 10 is on justice involved programs. And so again, you'll see a brief description of what the strategy is, um, why they're important, and again, the different blocks and links um, listed here and the contact information. And um, if there's more than one contact that's relevant, we've listed both email addresses here. Um, both the Division of Mental Health and Division of Public Health has a lot of work in this area. Um, and another key section that we want to highlight, um, just recognizing that you know, everyone might be at different parts of the planning process. Um, and so we have a general support and resources section here. Um, so we really just wanna encourage people to not feel like they have to reinvent the wheel and that, you know, efforts won't be duplicated. Um, you have some guidance on where to get started and where to get an understanding of who in your jurisdiction might already be doing some of this work. Um, and so some of the recommendations we have here are just reaching out to your local health department or just district. Um, many times uh, they may already have some kind of program or partnership with a community-based organization um, that is doing a lot of work in overdose prevention, harm reduction, treatment access, or other types of linkages to care. Um, we also just recommend broadly connecting with a wide range of technical assistance providers. Um, this link refers to the work that we do in the injury and violence prevention branch, but you'll hear from us time and time and again um, the importance of connecting with people with lived experience. And um, that includes both active and former drug users. You know, every community has people who use drugs. And so you want to get an understanding of what the local needs are and what the landscape looks like, um, whether it's drug supply related, whether it's certain practices um, that you want to make sure folks are able to prevent, you know, transmission of infection diseases or anything like that. Um, and so it's just really important to make sure that we have the most relevant um, group represented in the, pop, uh, in the program development and leading the efforts as well. Um, also, we have some of the resources you may have heard about already, like the menu of local actions, um, more powerful and see. Um, you can also review what strategies and efforts are already going on in your jurisdiction by looking at the North Carolina Opioid and Substance Use Action Plan dashboard. Um, that's structured by county. And we are in the process of updating that right now. Um, and that is managed, those updates are managed through the local health department. So 
if you're seeing any information that's inaccurate, um, there's a link on the website or you can contact us and we can give you that link um, to help make sure things are being updated. But just wanted to recognize that we are in the process of that and we do rely on input from you all to help us keep that information updated. Um, and last but not least, we also have a couple foundational resources that we recommend everyone to look at regardless of where you are in your planning process. Um, I think the principles of cultural humility and just knowing how to work with um, people who use drugs are an important component for all of this work, um, as well as health equity and inclusive communication. So just making sure that this section is highlighted because these do serve as foundational materials, even if you know what strategies you're selecting. And if you don't, it's a great uh, starting point so that you have some guidance on how to go about this work if you haven't already. Um, and this contact information goes to us at the Injury and Violence Prevention Branch. But again, we are well connected to other partners um, across DHHS and beyond. And so we're happy to connect you with different people um, across the state, whether it's at the local or state level, just to make sure everyone is well supported in this work. Just transitioning. I think we can go back to the slides whenever you get a moment. Thank you. And um, as always, y'all are welcome to continue putting chats and questions in the chat box. And we're going to wait until the end um, to go through them. And we're just going to keep rolling through the agenda. Um, and next up, we're going to begin a session on regional and local planning efforts led by April Bragg from the Dogwood Health Trust. Thank you so much, Amy. Thank you to the department and to DOJ for the generous invitation to speak today and for all your tremendous work and leadership um, to help promote healing across the state in the wake of this epidemic. We are super excited and grateful to be here to talk about our work in West North Carolina to partner with communities in planning for the opioid settlement and for our portion of the agenda today. What I thought I would do is start with a brief overview of Dogwood Health Trust, and then I'll share more about the work we're doing regarding opioid settlement planning in West North Carolina. And then I'm also very excited to have one of our partners, Danny Hampton, join me for a bit at the um, end of my remarks to talk about their opioid planning work in McDowell County. Next slide. Dogwood Health Trust is a private foundation. We're based in Asheville. Um, we are created by the sale of Mission Health System and are a resource for the Western North Carolina region in perpetuity. And that means that our grant making continues year after year. We are completely independent, governed by a volunteer board of directors and regulated by the IRS. And we provide grants to the community of Western North Carolina upwards of 50 million annually. For instance, in um, 2021, we are on track to pay out over 66 million in awards throughout Western North Carolina. And this map here on the screen shows the counties that we serve, which are the 18 counties west of and including Avery, Burke, and Rutherford County, and the Eastern Band of Cherokee at the Quala Boundary, which is um, in red in the middle of the map. Next slide, please. At Dogwood, our mission is to dramatically improve the health and well being of all people and communities of Western North Carolina. Next slide. So, how do we endeavor to do this? Um, our grant making is focused on the social determinants of health, which I'm sure many of you listening know well as the non clinical factors that contribute to your overall health, things like poverty, food security where you live, your physical environment, indoors, outdoors, whether or not you have a job that allows you to care for yourself or your family, your access to opportunities, recreation and exercise. And so since these are critical components of overall health, at Dogwood, we partner with communities to address gaps in these areas so that we can help dramatically improve the health and well-being of Western North Carolina residents. Next slide, please. Our strategic priorities in this work are these four areas. Housing, where we partner to increase availability of affordable housing and supportive housing. Education, and in this um, priority, we invest 
across all sectors, early childhood, K through 12 and post-secondary economic opportunity, which includes increasing availability of jobs as well as workforce and economic vitality for the region. And then our fourth area, which is the one we'll be talking about today, health and wellness. Next slide, please. So for us at Dogwood, it all boils down to this. We want to create a Western North Carolina where every generation can live, learn, earn, and thrive with dignity and opportunity for all, no exceptions. And the, our strategic priorities for grant making are all in service of this vision. And the no exceptions part is really important. It's a reminder of our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and that our actions and everything we do need to be, move beyond just words or lip service. We believe that's the only way we'll live into our purpose to dramatically improve health and well-being for all people and communities in Western North Carolina. So next slide. So this is our fourth area, health and wellness, and that's where we focus on things like health disparities and access to care for the uninsured. Um, you'll see some other areas um, within this um, priority listed here, um, but the subject we'll be discussing today, which is included, is behavioral health and substance use disorder. Next slide. So for this area, we have a commitment to award $5 million annually at minimum through 2024 and we do this in collaboration with the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services and in alignment with their opioid and substance use action plan. And we've just been really um, pleased to work with Cody Kinsley, Elise Powell, who Steve mentioned, um, Jessica Dickin, Alyssa, and Amy in, in this work. Um, and just really grateful for their leadership in developing the action plan and um, really identifying ways in which we can use evidence-based strategies and communities to um, address and prom promote heal, address the epidemic and promote healing. So in this work, we really see the opioid settlement as a remarkable and unique opportunity to grade funding and leverage planning investments for positive impact for communities in the wake of the ongoing op opioid epidemic. And as A.G. Stein mentioned in his remarks, as we all realize all too well, um, the opioid epidemic has touched all of us. Um, it's impacted and has implications for multiple sectors, housing, workforce, economic opportunity, health and wellness. And it was already quite a difficult challenge for our communities. And then we ended up in a global pandemic. And as A.J. Stein mentioned, it now presents an even greater challenge as anxiety and depression rates have gone up, alcohol sales and overdose rates have increased in many areas. You all have been on the front lines and you've been on this call. Um, and so really we see this settlement as a historic opportunity um, to help turn the tide. And it's projected to provide counties with 18 years of funding as um, previously mentioned. And this is particularly important in our region of Western North Carolina where all of our 18 counties ranked behavioral health or substance use disorder as one of their top three health priorities in their most recent community health needs assessment. So in concert with the AG's work on the opioid settlement, Dogwood wanted to provide additional support opportunities to counties and municipalities to help them plan for this historic funding stream in alignment with the MOA that Steve described earlier. And this is because we really believe um, that thoughtful and intentional planning as outlined in MOA is more likely to maximize the impact of the settlement in terms of lives saved and deaths averted going forward for our communities. Next slide, please. So in July, we released a request for proposals from jurisdictions in Western North Carolina participating in the settlement for support with planning for the settlement. And we had a truly wonderful response with some terrific applications submitted. This opportunity offers planning funding of up to 300,000 annually for up to two years. And we currently have 3.7 million in the award process for this first round of grants. We're planning a second RFP in the next two to three months for counties and municipalities in West North Carolina that were unable to take advantage during the first round. And for this RFP, we really use the MOA as a guide. We define planning fairly broadly. It can be strategic planning, cost process planning, capacity building through partnership cultivation, needs assessment, data collection. But what we're most excited about is that we're really hoping it will allow for two things. Um, the first, 
is more regional planning. As you can see from that amazing website we just, we just saw, counties will have connectivity to be able to learn from each other, collaborate more easily, and instead of reinventing the wheel or working in isolation, truly partner and work together to maximize impact. We at DOG will be convening our grantees regularly so that they can stay abreast of what each other are doing and really maximize opportunities to learn from each other and work together as opposed to working in silos and collaborate across county lines when that's strategic. And so we're excited, really excited about that. And Danny's gonna talk a little bit more about that here shortly. And um, the second aspect of this that we're super excited about is we really hope with this, um, with these grants that they'll be able to support counties and municipalities and allowing for deeper community engagement in planning. And this means deeper involvement of individuals with lived experience with opioid and substance use, deeper involvement of community members whose voices have often not been heard because of things like systemic racism or other disparities, deeper involvement of families who have been personally impacted by this devastating crisis. It, it seems that resources to support this kind of deeper, more strategic work are sometimes hard to find, limited in our communities. Um, so we're excited to be able to provide this support in hopes of maximizing positive impact of the settlement dollars in West North Carolina. And we look forward to keeping you all posted on how all the projects are going um, in terms of planning and preparation for the settlement. Next slide. So with that, I want to introduce one of our partners in this planning work, Danny Hampson from Freedom Life in McDowell County. The nonprofit Freedom Life is working closely with McDowell County and the McDowell Substance Use Coalition to help prepare for the settlement and address substance misuse. They've been doing great work on this issue for a while now. And so Danny's going to tell you a bit about who they are, what they've been up to, and what their plans are for um, this funding. Okay, Danny, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, April. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. It's an honor to be able to be part of this meeting and also part of the discussion that is so critical um, for all of our counties and communities across uh, the wonderful state of North Carolina. My name is Danny Hampton. I'm the executive director for a re-entry organization um, called Freedom Life. Um, we are partnered with the North Carolina Department of Public Safety as a re-entry council intermediary agency. Um, and we do pre and post release work uh, with men and women um, who have faced incarceration and also work with them as they reintegrate back into the community to provide um, comprehensive and holistic supportive services um, for them when they get out, um, as well as to provide planning for them while they're still inside. We are also the, the backbone organization and partner with the McDowell Substance Use Coalition. Um, we've been a part of coalition work for the last eight years. Um, when we first started doing reentry work, we realized that approximately 80% of the men and women that we seek to help and to serve struggled with some type or form of substance misuse. And we knew that we had to partner with our community if we were going to be able to make a difference in that regard. And so we have been partnered with the Substance Use Coalition, which itself has over 25 different agencies and organizations within it from across McDowell County. Um, that, uh, again, has been working very hard over the last few years to, to do the work and, and try to develop strategies uh, to engage um, the extreme substance use needs that we see within our county. Uh, we are also partnered uh, as a coalition we are partnered with McDowell County itself and McDowell County government or McDowell County commissioners. And we are very grateful for their, um, for their heart and concern for our community. And, uh, and so we realized when the opioid settlement funding um, was going to be coming, coming out, even though we weren't sure when, we knew that we needed to get on the, the front end of the curve of being able to do the work to prepare so that funding could be um, managed and invested within our community in the most effective ways. Um, and we are very grateful to Dogwood and for um, the kind of support that they're providing. We're also grateful for their desire to also see other philanthropic organizations partner even together with organizations that they're partnered with. And we have had the privilege of doing that in, in the beginning of 2021. Uh, we were able to partner with Kate B. Reynolds, who has been in our county for a while doing incredible work. And um, 
And so uh, we wrote a grant with KB Rentals and were able to receive a grant that was for the purpose of building up health coalition capacity. Um, we realized that opioid settlement funding investment was gonna require an organizational approach that was uh, itself very solid and, and very capable. And one of the goals that we realized right away is if the McDowell Substance Use Coalition was going to be able to really go to the next level, we needed to be able to hire a full-time program director. Um, and with the help and support of Kate B. Reynolds, uh, we have been able to do that. Um, she's actually, you see her on the screen with me right now, Angela Grubb, and we are very excited about um, her work that she brings, her experience that she brings from across our state, as well as in research uh, and other areas of mental health and substance use um, um, areas of, of investment. And so um, through, through the funding to Kate B. Reynolds, we've been working to build up coalition capacity and county partnership capability in anticipation of preparing to do the, the grant planning that was nest, that uh, is necessary for, for being able to move the potential forward of, of what can happen. And, um, and then Dogwood presented their RFP, if you've heard a April mention already in July, which was absolutely perfect um, because um, through the, the funding that Dogwood is making possible, we're able to do on a community-wide development level, the very thing through the support of Kate B. Reynolds that we've been able to do on a, on a coalition capacity development level. Um, and through the Kate B. Reynolds funding, and then also the additional funding of Dogwood, we have been able to have be in partnership with uh, the North Carolina Institute of Public Health, as well as the North Carolina Center for Health and Wellness, as well as Rural Forward North Carolina. These are three very significant uh, TA organizations that we've been partnered with um, for actually for now going on three years with um, and, and some of the work that we've been doing in preparation for both the settlement funding, but also in just trying to, to tackle the very difficult um, dynamics of, of how to best address the needs of our community when it comes to substance misuse. So um, we are very grateful that, um, that we've been able to work with them. We've been doing a lot of strategic planning with them. Uh, we've been doing some community research with them as well. Now through the funding of Dogwood, we're actually have a very robust plan to do planning. Um, the grant that, uh, that Dogwood has awarded um, McDowell County is going to give us a capacity to hire a full-time peer support planning um, strategist, as well as to hire four part-time community um, connection liaisons. And our, our purpose in this grant is to really dig deep into um, the grassroots need of our community to give voice to the people groups of our community to make sure that we're, we're covering the entire diversity of our community. And so these liaisons are gonna be strategic partners uh, who are coming from literally the, the, the various people groups of our community to be able to help us develop networking, to be able to do in-depth data research. Um, next year alone, we plan on conducting um, a very aggressive 24 focus groups um, from across all the people groups of our county, including people with lived experience, and, uh, and, and to really start trying to pull data in that's going to give us the greatest picture, data-informed um, information that we need as the opioid settlements funding are coming down to be able to put together the strategies that, that um, can help us in the investment of the funding, but also in doing this deep um, grassroots community connecting, we're also going to be able to then, as, as we plan in opioid settlement fund investing, we also need to be able to develop the initiatives and the programs that will meet the needs of the community research that we've been able to conduct and be able to draw it out and um, that information and combine it with program initiation. And so we're, we're going to be planning for, for opioid settlement investment in both the research gathering and also then the program designing that's gonna be developed around the information that we're able to get. And because of the connections that we've made, we'll be able to bring back into the county through those networks, what we've been also be able to draw from the county in information and data research. So we'll already have all of the linkages to really do robust program initiation and implementation with, with county development and capacity already there. And in addition to this, we're also excited because um, we've, we've, we're, we've been able to partner uh, in McDowell County um, and in reentry work with Avery County. And in writing this grant with Dogwood, um, 
we have been able to start laying the framework for actually helping Avery County develop a very robust reentry program that also um, serves both the pre-release and post-release needs of individuals. Because as I'm sure everybody knows on this call, the highest risk group for overdose are men and women who are coming out of incarceration. And so we wanna make sure that we're doing everything we can to help prevent that. And that requires pre and post release planning and programming, programmatic engagement. So uh, we are very excited about the work that we're going to be doing in Avery County um, in the partnership with McDowell County uh, and with Freedom Life and even with our coalition to begin to, to take the planning and capacity development into even a regional uh, work. And uh, we're also excited about the work we're going to be able to do with students in areas of prevention. Um, we have some wonderful um, support teams and, and agencies and individuals that have been doing a lot of great work in our student population. And uh, we are just very excited that the timing is perfect, that Dogwood is being um, is, is offering the support that they are for the planning that is so critical to make sure that every dollar that's being invested is going to be invested wisely with the greatest potential for community impact. And so um, with that said, I will actually turn things back over to April and until uh, and she, it's up to you now where we go from here. Great. Thank you so much, Danny and Angela, for joining. Um, it's just wonderful to hear, um, Danny, the story about the work you all have been doing that sort of led to this point. And we're really excited to partner with you all. Um, and especially the partnership with Avery County and being able to you know, partner across county lines um, instead of you know, reinventing the wheel. And Avery County, you know, they'll be able to work with you on this um, and reentry work that um, is aligned with what we know about evidence-based approaches and MOA and addressing the needs of this population. So, so thank you so much for joining. And um, I also want to uh, mention to folks on the know we're taking questions in the chat, but if you have any um, questions for me or Danny and Angela after this meeting, feel free to go to our website at Dogwood Health Trust. It's www.dht.org. And you can find my email um, and there, or feel free to obviously contact Sarah um, at, um, at DHHS, the meeting organizer, and um, she can put you in touch with me as well. But we're happy to answer any additional questions after the fact as well. And now I want to introduce the fabulous Kathy Colville for the next part of our agenda. Kathy's president and CEO at the North Carolina Institute of Medicine. And she will be hosting a panel discussion for us entitled Connecting Institutional and Grassroots Partners to Promote Effective Strategies. Kathy? Thank you so much, April. And good morning, everyone, and happy Friday. I'm so pleased to be with you. And even though we are not together in person, it's wonderful to be connected and talking about this important work. Please go to the next slide. I'm also really grateful to have four really insightful and thoughtful people. And we're here to have kind of a different kind of discussion this morning. I wanna welcome Jasmine Beach Ferrara of the Buncombe County Commissioners, Raymond Velasquez of the Western North Carolina AIDS Project, Louise Vincent of the North Carolina Survivors Union, and my colleague, Allison Miller at the North Carolina Institute of Medicine, who works right alongside me. For all of you today, our goal is really an honest, open, transparent and non-judgmental discussion about a very difficult but important and critical topic. And that is the inclusion of people who use drugs in the design and implementation of programs and services that are intended to help people who use drugs. And we welcome you into this conversation, no matter where you may be in this work. Maybe this is pretty brand new and challenging content to you. Maybe you are an expert in this way of working and planning. No matter what, we're really glad that we're having this conversation with you. And if you look on the next slide, I'm just going to share in the spirit of transparency and honesty some of my own perspective on this issue. I'm an 80s kid. I grew up with the messages on the left hand side here. Two really prominent ones in my memory are to just say no to drugs. And then that ad that I feel came up all the time on Saturday cartoons about your fried egg being a brain on drugs. And if you're a kid from the 80s, you might remember these as well. Um, and while a lot of research might have said that these may not have been as effective as they were intended, these were very memorable messages for me. And they made me scared of drugs. And they also made me scared of people who use drugs. 
And in the end, I ended up going through my teenage years and my and growing into adulthood without having much exposure to drug use. And my maybe that kind of helped me um, as a teenager, but I will say that my ignorance and fear of drugs don't really serve me that well as a community health practitioner who's trying to develop programs to prevent overdose and other harms. But I own it. That's part of my experience. I don't apologize for it. It's there and it's part of the swirl. Um, but two other really important parts of my perspective um, are, are, are focus on results. Doing high quality and effective work is really important to me. And if you look at this third um, picture here, this is a headline taken from 2015. Um, and I started to pay a lot of attention to um, harm reduction, despite, again, not really having a strong connection to this, because I started to hear about the dramatic results that were coming out of that. And this headline is in particular from Indiana, when then Governor Mike Pence issued an executive order to allow that state's first syringe services program, um, which, as you can see here, um, had a dramatic effect on reducing transmission of HIV. And this type of thing is so important to me, the idea of focusing on results and focusing on getting to good health outcomes. And then finally, this last picture here is an important part of my perspective as well. My own experience as a community health practitioner is that our work is so, so much better when we agency people um, are working alongside the people that we are trying to help and that they have they have not just token participation, but they're making decisions, they're informing, they're helping to change the design. But so often it's hard to do this. And so often, even though my own conscience tells me to do it, we skip this step as agency people and we have to stop doing this. And that's part of what we're exploring today is how to do this better, especially for those of you that want to do it, but have found um, barriers and challenges to doing so. And I wanted to think of a metaphor um, for you know, what this looks like and how absurd it is that we sometimes will create programs intended to help people who use drugs without them at the table. I wanted to imagine that in your counties, you were putting together, let's say you had a whole bunch of money that all of a sudden came from a settlement that you were able to serve older adults in your community. Senior services uh, were about to be fundamentally changed, but you put together a team of only 20 somethings to design that. And how strange that would be to put a table together like that and not include older adults. Because even the most insightful 20-somethings, maybe they've read all the literature, maybe they've talked to people, they would fail to do that well without having the people in the room working alongside them in order to get the best results. On the next slide, I just want to reiterate the transformative potential of the settlement funds and this is a fantastic time for you to assess really who is at your table. Whether your table looks like a real table or on the next slide, you're meeting on a Zoom screen right now. And on the next slide, we wanna underscore the importance of the best practice of meaningful inclusion of people with lived experience at that table. And this is actually a screenshot from the MOA. It's a category that's so important that it's defined in the MOA as one of the best practices for that community planning. On the next slide, as our team was preparing this segment of today's meeting, we talked about really key messages that we wanted to make sure we conveyed. And I'll share that the words that came up over and over in our planning were authentic and messy. And I think that really sounds like life. So I want us to make sure that we don't pretend that this is easy work, but we do want to underscore these key messages that assuring that people who use drugs are meaningfully included in the design of the services intended to help them first has a strong scientific evidence base, that it can truly be life-changing for everyone involved, whether you're a person who uses drugs or not, that it's also important that we recognize it can be challenging, it requires changes to how we've always done it, but that it's worth that hard work. And finally, that this begins and ends with relationships, and of course, authentic relationships. So let's go to the next slide. 
we want you to think about your community and how your planning table functions right now. And we're gonna take you through this useful visual to think through what might be possible for your team and also to look realistically at where you are right now. And Jasmine and Louise are gonna help take us through this, through this spectrum of inclusion depicted in this pyramid. I want you to be thinking about how your planning team includes the voices of people who use drugs. I'll turn it over to you, Louise and Jasmine. Great, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I don't know whether you can see me. I turned on my video. We can see you. Yep, we can see and hear you. Okay, I just can't see myself. Okay, that's even better. <laughs> All right. All right, do you want me to start or would you like to start? Uh, you should go ahead. Okay, great. So uh, this is a pyramid of involvement and inclusion that um, I found some years ago that I really felt um, helped us look at the expertise of people that use drugs and what and how we can include folks. And, and I think it allows us a stepwise process so that we don't have to do these things all at once, right? I think sometimes we think we've got to figure this all out at one time and we've got to, we've got to do everything, you know, in one, in one big troop. Um, but if you look here, we have sort of at the bottom, we have the target audience. So just being audience, you know, just sort of being audience members or just watching or just learning um, or maybe in some sort of leadership training. So just being trained um, contributors. So this is when people are actually contributing in activities, um, providing, you know, providing some some, in, you know, insight. And then we get to speakers. And I think we, we, we do speakers a lot, right? So we often want to hear what someone's lived experience looks like or, or we are in, interested in um, someone's specific lived experience, experience. But then we get into implementers and experts and decision makers. And those are the areas where we can really do um, and we can really see the amazing good and, and, and and when this thing really comes together, um, I know in in my own work and watching it sort of it, in my own life, watching as I've sort of climbed up and down this pyramid, um, when when we have decision makers, and it, and you can't start there, because the truth of the matter is, is we aren't just experts because we're drug users, right? That's that's a thing we say sometimes, but it's confusing. Um, we have to do the hard work of unpacking the drug war, and we have to do the hard work of, of um, you know, being educated and and um, and and attending, you know, some of these some of these uh, events that folks have, and and really learning about public health and learning about how uh, the social determinants of, of health have impacted our lives. Otherwise, we have people on advisory boards saying things like, it's a good thing I went to prison because they've not done the work to unpack how the social determinants of health have impacted their life. Thank you, Louise. Jasmine, what would you add about this pyramid of involvement? Um, there's a lot that I like about this pyramid in, in terms of just how it delineates the many different kinds of leadership and involvement that are really required, I think, to make sure that the um, programs and strategies going out in the community are um, going to be impactful and are shaped by the lived experience and expertise of folks who understand issues. And, and Louise has said, understand the lived experience part of issues and also um, the broader analysis of, of how a program can serve, um, you know, a, a broad and diverse community of folks. Um, you know, I mean, I, th I think a few things that um, stand out to me about this are that at, and I'm talking here as a perspective of someone working within county government as a commissioner, is that um, you really working this model, um, which I don't see as a linear one necessarily, mm -hmm. uh, pushes institutions like a county government to be nimble, to be creative, to be willing to um, uh, uh, slow processes down to make sure that there's opportunities for involvement. Um, and also, you know, I think um, would lift up in here, it's something that I think is particularly critical in this work is just that, um, uh, we understand that uh, people can play more than one role here over time. 
um, mm -hmm. and um, making sure that there are sort of many channels open for communication, making sure that um, those channels exist outside of governmental buildings and formal meeting settings, um, and uh, making sure that folks who are in the decision-making role are just getting to do sort of a lot of the, the listening and showing up in relationship building um, that can help, uh, I think, uh, us learn and be educated and be humbled in the ways we need to be to um, work with community to develop these strategies. So I, I, I love this model for the ways that it sort of cracks open, I think, some of the traditional um, modalities through which community members can engage with and advocate for and shape governmental work, you know, which is like serve on a formal advisory committee and present your findings and recommendations in a very formal setting. Um, and, you know, that just doesn't map on to uh, so much of how people's lives work and I think mm -hmm. how actually arrive at, at programs, particularly around issues related to um, addiction uh, that will actually meet people where they are. Thank you so much. Um, and I, I think I appreciate this pyramid because it helps me also to see, I mean, I just in so many of the situations I might find myself at the bottom and it gives me some ideas about what I'm working towards as well. I also take very much that this isn't necessarily linear. This makes it, makes it a little bit tidier than we've already um, mentioned it might be. But I will underscore that for me, what's really important is that in order to make those changes that Jasmine talked about, about maybe changes to your meeting practices, going a little bit more slowly, doing different types of um, inclusion, it's important for me to know that that's working towards a strong set of results and evidence. So we're gonna ask Allison Miller to take us through a very brief review of what this evidence looks like. And we'll go to the next slide to start with that. Great, thanks so much, Kathy. And it's so nice to be here with all of you today. I'm just going to talk for a few minutes about engaging directly impacted people in strategic planning and program development. Um, so, all right, why is it important to meaningfully engage people who use drugs and people with lived experience? There are several key reasons. Um, engagement can promote understanding of what people who use drugs need in terms of both services and supports, as well as the barriers they might face including stigma and structural barriers such as transportation and so on. It also helps to build trust with the people and communities served by strategies and programs to address addiction and overdose. Without trust, uptake or willingness to receive services and supports could be low. Um, but trust is bi-directional too. So building, building relationships with directly impacted people can reduce stigma surrounding drug use and create employment and other opportunities that might not exist otherwise. And increasing understanding of what people who use drugs need and building relationships grounded in trust can support the development and implementation of effective strategies that reflect the information, thoughts, and experiences of directly impacted people. Next slide, please. So there's a lot more that could be said about the evidence to support this work, but I wanted to give a quick overview of the conceptual underpinnings and the translation of academic research in this area into practice. Uh, Kathy touched on this in her presentation as well, but the idea of nothing about us without us has been described and included in recommendations from a number of organizations over the years. Uh, this CDC report from 2018 describes this idea, stating that public policies should not be written or put into place officially or unofficially without the direction and input of people who will be affected by that policy. And it continues on to say that, or to support the involvement of uh, people directly impacted by opioid use in particular in the design, implementation, and evaluation of interventions to assure that those efforts are responsive to local realities and can achieve their desired goals. And North Carolina's own uh, opioid and substance use action plan calls for centering lived experience by hiring, contracting, and collaborating with historically marginalized populations in all phases of organizational development as well. And then on the research side, community-based participatory research studies have examined the involvement of those affected by an issue for the purposes of education and action or affecting social change. Um, so all of that to say, this is not a new concept and it's been studied and applied in a number of other contexts, ranging from asthma, cancer, obesity, and HIV AIDS, in addition to substance use. Next slide, please. So I'll end here by sharing this table from a paper in the Journal of Substance Use Treatment, Prevention and Policy, where the authors reviewed the academic literature around working with people who use drugs and the design and implementation of programs and interventions. Um, and it found that reductions, uh, it found reductions in risk behaviors related to HIV 
uh, sexual activity and injection drug use, as well as improved outreach to more diverse communities and success in reaching higher risk groups. Um, so with that, I'll hand it back over to you, Kathy, and thanks again for your time this morning. Thanks, Allison. All right, and now we're gonna come and talk to our panel. So we've got with us for this discussion, Jasmine Beach Ferrara, Louise Vincent, and Raymond Velasquez. And Louise, I'm gonna to go to you first. Louise, okay. when we were um, talking and preparing for this, you mentioned that you've been a part of some work that's at kind of the top of that pyramid and that that experience for you has been extraordinarily important. So can you share with us kind of what that felt like, what that looked like, and what Absolutely. someone in your position and from your perspective has to offer when you're included at the planning table as an expert or a decision maker? Yeah, thank you, uh, Kathy. I think this is one of the, the real uh, joys of my life. Um, you know, I'm involved in a national union, and the national union is made up of people that use drugs that have really done this hard work. Right. This is a group of people that has, has traveled around the world, been involved in planning committees, been involved in, you know, board, you know, sit on, they sit on boards, they, you know, they work in the field. Um, and, and, and I've got to tell you, um, the kinds of, the, the kinds of outcomes we see, the things we are able to do, the, the ways we are able to build and lead and grow, um, and 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 truly come up with interventions and and really be part of um, a process that's meaningful, right? It's not just a process where we're sitting at a table, um, listening, but but we really are collaborating and being treated with dignity and respect, um, and seen as as really the the, the people that should be um, making decisions. Um, I've got to say, in, in in just in North Carolina Survivors Union, um, the work we're doing with the researchers. Um, uh, right now, uh, you know, we have, you know, sort of set out what we believe research should look like and, and that it should be participatory and we should have a say in the research that happens and we should be leading that process. Um, and those are things that are happening. Um, uh, you know, we had a, we had a, a, a woman and a, a man come in the other day to our office and, um, and, and we are doing drug testing and checking now. And, and one of the things that happened is, you know, we, we brought them back, they tested their drugs and they found xylazine in the drugs. And, and we were sharing with them what the scars and the soft tissue infections look like from, from that. And I shared my, my own personal experience. And, you know, the man looked at the woman and, and I could tell that this was already happening to her. And in that moment, you know, they were able to throw away the drugs and they were able to, you know, and this is something that people say would never happen, right? This is something that people would say is impossible. Drug users don't throw away drugs. And, and our whole office was moved by the entire experience of, of just everyone being there for this group, everyone understanding the, the hardship, everyone understanding, you know, how important it was that this family or this 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 couple was supported in, in this moment and their willingness to trust us um, mm -hmm. that this was a dangerous drug that they should, you know, move away from, um, you know, when we have the ability to, to, to sit and lead and grow and drive programs, really powerful stuff happens. Mm -hmm. That is, I mean, Louise, I learned so much every time I talk with you. Thank you for that story. Ray, I want to turn to you because I know that some of this is, is part of your experience as well. I want to ask that same question. How does it feel to be meaningfully included? What are some of the vulnerabilities too about being a part of these tables? Yes, absolutely. And uh, thank you for allowing me to be here today. Um, I think uh, one of the, what's important to me is for uh, the longest time uh, the American healthcare system has historically um, not included or marginalized and stigmatized um, people with substance use disorders and also people of color. And um, the attorney general earlier had mentioned, um, this is a once in a lifetime um, opportunity to, to really make change. Um, and this opportunity will probably never come again. And, um, and this essentially just being had, be able to have a seat at the table and um, who's gonna, who is better to tell you 
um, what is best for yourself than yourself. Like who, who's here to make that decision without including you? Um, and that's why it's so important for someone like myself or, or anyone else um, struggling with addiction or also in recovery to have a position and a voice at this table. Um, I've seen I've unspeakable things, I've lost many friends, I've lost my mother, and I, I just try every day to be the best voice I can for, for the community that we serve and the community that I've been part of and a part of. And it, it, it just cannot stop here. This can't be the last discussion that like people like Luis and myself are sitting at. It needs to continue. And I'm really hoping um, that is done and um, also that we all do what needs to be done together. Um, and that's important. Thank you so much, Ray. And um, you know, it's really why we're here is to really steel ourselves and to understand the why, right? Like, why would we do this? Strong evidence base, nothing about us without us, that like those really important and critical things, but also to really acknowledge that this isn't easy. It isn't easy for anybody at the table for this to work really well. And I want to turn to um, Commissioner, Commissioner Jasmine, <laughs> Commissioner Beach Ferrara, and ask you to talk about your perspective as somebody working in government. I know that you support this, but I also know that you can share a perspective about how inviting people who use drugs to an official table could open you to criticism of the inappropriate use of taxpayer funds, of being associated with people that are stigmatized. I wanted you to share a little bit about both why you think this is important and the types of criticism that you might face, or that some of your commissioners, especially in other parts of the state, might face in doing this as well, because you know that's a, an important aspect for us to acknowledge. Well, thank you all for the opportunity. I've been learning a lot this morning. Um, and in many ways, I want to just echo and continue to amplify what Louise and Raymond have said, um, which is, you know, the, the why on this, particularly as we sort of uh, prepare as a state to go down the runway with the settlement funding um, and the tremendous opportunity there. The why is that um, if we want these dollars to really go to work um, and if we want to really have the opportunity to meet folks where they are and, and help people rebuild uh, their lives, um, it has to be informed by, um, you know, strategies that will actually work. Um, and I think, you know, kind of baked into that slide that you opened with Kathy around the just say no to drugs is a long legacy of strategies that didn't work and that did a lot of harm in the process. Um, and we have a moment now where I think we understand so much more about substance use disorder. We have the kind of bridges that have been built because of the hard work of of folks like Louise and Raymond and their colleagues um, and, and folks in the public health field that we, we know so much more. Um, we understand the harms of the last several decades of, of drug policy and interventions and we have a chance to do it differently. And I think that that's a big piece of the, the why and the urgency of this moment around how we have to push ourselves and I'll speak here from sort of the governmental perspective, how we have to push ourselves to sort of meet the moment um, and understand that it's going to take um, different approaches. It's, it's going to perhaps be messy in some ways that don't always feel comfortable in governmental environments, but that are still okay. We're gonna be okay, even if it's messy for a little while. Um, and also be vulnerable in ways around these issues. Um, and I'll speak to that, uh, the two sides of that vulnerability I see come up here. Kathy, you alluded to one side. Um, that's the kind of very real political critique and heat that can come when we're talking um, about evidence-based uh, work around mm -hmm. responding to, to the opioid crisis, right? We're talking about syringe uh, exchange programs, or we're talking about harm reduction models that are that have um, government funding. Um, there's real opportunities for dialogue and education in this, um, and and I think it would be naive for, to to expect that there wouldn't be political critique and heat around it. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've certainly heard many of the things that you kind of mentioned in passing um, when, when we've introduced different initiatives um, here in Buncombe County. Um, now, the other piece of the vulnerability here, I think, is how we respond, is, is how we address that, which is that the other reality is that so many people's lives have been touched by the opiate crisis. It doesn't respect any boundaries or borders in our lives. It doesn't respect 
county borders, state borders. It doesn't respect anything related to race, class, religion. Um, and I think that that is how we work our way through the um, what can feel at times like the political minefields is being uh, uh, vulnerable and open and honest about that. And, and so many people have been brave in sharing those stories, whether it's their own life, whether that's their child's life or another loved one. Mm -hmm. um, and it really humanizes and creates a common understanding. My experience around uh, sort of how we've been able to build diverse political coalitions around responding to the opioid crisis is recognizing that we may come to the table along different paths. Um, and um, But once we're at the table, um, there's a lot of uh, shared will to figure out solutions that will actually help people and meet them where they are. So I think it's important to be braced and prepared and, and clear eyed about, you know, eyes wide open about the politics of this, but also not to feel paralyzed by that. And to know that on the other side of that, um, there's opportunities, I think, for the kind of conversations we absolutely need to be having in our state around the realities of drug use and substance use disorder and how many people's lives are impacted one way or another by that. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I want to underscore that. Let's not pretend this is like we can take a CDC recommendation and do this and um and and yay, everything is good, right? I think you said, let's keep our eyes wide open to the political realities of that, but not let ourselves be paralyzed by some concern about that. Because there is there is justification and there's there in many different ways and, and, and right reasons for doing this and taking this approach. I appreciate that. I wanna go, go ahead, Louise. I just wanna say one thing, you know, there's something you stressed and that was that this, this is hard work. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wanna say, it's not always hard work, right? We're doing it right now, right? Mm -hmm. Not that uncomfortable, mm -hmm. right? So it's happening right now. And so I just want to point that out because I don't want people to walk away feeling, oh, this is terribly scary or terribly, you know, this has always got to be so hard. Mm -hmm. This is not, you know, sure, it can be difficult and there are really difficult parts of it, but there are also pieces that are just natural. And, 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 and it's not always all of that difficult. So I just wanted to say that. Yeah, I appreciate that. I would totally that. echo that just briefly. It's often a lot of fun and there's joy and you build mm -hmm. friendships and connections um, that show up in every part of your life and community. So absolutely. Yeah, thank you for, thank you for getting me back onto that. I think I just don't wanna paint a picture like um, a paint, a, a naive picture, but I want to echo that as well. And I think Louise, on one of our conversations, you said it isn't just about working together. It's about these authentic relationships. And for me, as somebody, as I mentioned, who has been so sort of sheltered and naive, those relationships have absolutely, they've just added another dimension to my own life. Um, and they've been so rewarding in that way as well. I want to um, turn back to you, Ray, for a second and just share with you um, something that makes you hopeful about um, the inclusion of people who use drugs and people with lived experience. Like what's a bright spot that you see or um, something that's, that's making you hopeful about this work in North Carolina right now? Absolutely. So I am newer to uh, North Carolina and um, in on my journey. So, um, you know, I, I think what is um, exciting about this um, is just the opportunities for my voice to be heard. Um, and we mentioned a lot about uh, connection um, in, just a few minutes ago. And when you, you know, we're working um, at the Certain Service Program, you know, I've been here for over a year now. So I, I, I see a lot of the same people. I see them um, when I see some of my family sometimes. And it's, you know, it's building connections and, and, and relationships. And that's more important. You know, Certain Service Programs, um, are way more than just handing out sterile supplies. Um, it's the honest and genuine connections that are being built. Um, the capacity, you know, in trust, it was huge. I forgot who mentioned trust earlier. Um, the building trust in the community is, is so huge. And um, letting, you know, your guard down, it, it creates a sense of, of safety. Um, you know, it takes a lot of energy and courage to come to the syringe service program. Um, so when you're creating that environment for, for people to come to, and it's, it's genuine. And um, that's why I'm thankful for part of our harm reduction program here at WinCAP is we have our community navigation program. Um, it's more one-on-one um, -on -one care 
um, kind of, it's like a, we create like a client-based, um, client-driven action plan um, to connect people to um, local resources um, from simply from setting a, getting an appointment at the DMV and providing transportation for that, or even further than that, um, at one point um, of discussions of MAT or you know other um, alternatives to getting into care and treatment. Um, so it, it's exciting that there's you know such a huge um, spotlight and opportunity um, for all of us to come together in different lines of work um, from local government um, to state government to syringe service programs and. Uh, people who um, do struggle with substance use. And it's just, it's incredible. And I'm, I'm very hopeful um, for the future that we'll be able to, to do a lot of good together and save lives. Great. I hear you saying that, that those connections are such a source of hope. And I think Louise shared that, like her whole team being so hopeful about being able to build trust with people who came to them and keep them away from harm earlier this week. So we're going to put a slide up about what's next for the planning team. I'm going to ask the panel to stay with me and you can um, help contribute to this as well. And this is really um, So it's really just a, for, for those of you who might find yourself kind of towards the bottom of that period or towards the middle, we wanted to talk about three areas um, that you and your planning team um, can think about in order to move forward. And the first one is about increasing your self-awareness of your own biases and assumptions, those things that may stand in the way of meaningful inclusion. The second is to pay some attention to history, research, and evidence. And the third is about authentic relationships. So I'm going to ask the panelists to jump in on this as well. But if we go to that first bullet point, um, thinking about how to increase your self-awareness is thinking about how you may take some time to think about, you know, if you were an 80s kid or a 90s kid or a 70s kid, what were the messages you absorbed from your family and your culture about drugs and about people who use drugs? Maybe you can reach out to somebody who grew up at your same time period. You can talk this through together and spend some time reflecting about the images that you remember, the messages that you received, and then the values that you hold now about this perspective. And maybe that's something for your planning team to talk about, um, to put on your agenda, to talk about what are the biases and images um, and assumptions and values that your, that your groups share. The other thing I would mention in the um, history, research, and evidence is thinking about um, going to some of these resources about evidence and the history of this work to understand the important contributions of people who use drugs to helping us develop some of the most effective strategies that we have in saving lives. There is actually now a, a, a history of harm reduction. It's not in our reference slide on here, but I'll put that link in the chat and I found that particularly useful. And then finally, the step towards developing authentic relationships with people who use drugs. Um, we mentioned that this work begins and ends with relationships. If these are not relationships that you have right now, think about taking that first step, reaching out to maybe an agency in your community that works on harm reduction. Um, and if you are a person who uses drugs, thinking about how you might reach out to um, might reach out to some of those institutional partners if you're not yet connected. So again, um, we, we're talking about this work being messy, authentic, also joyful, and very much worth it. Panelists, what would you add to this? Any next steps or suggestions that you have for planning teams that are trying to work a little bit, um, a little bit higher on the pyramid? Um, so ahead, I have please. a couple. Yeah, I have a couple of things that are on my mind. I think one, um, getting the jargon out, right? And really thinking about what these things mean. So, you know, I would encourage, you know, I would encourage this group and groups that are working on doing this to not, you know, meaningful inclusion, take that word out, make it so you can't say that. What does that actually mean, right? Like really digging deeper and, and, and building into this how are we going to do this, um, you know, and, and what, like, really sort of forcing yourself to, to, to look beyond um, or, or go beyond the words that we all know, because mm -hmm. that's the thing. We all know the right words to say. We all mm -hmm. know the right things to put in grant language. But do we actually know what these things mean? And do we actually know what, what, what's involved? So I think those action steps are really important and thinking about what those action steps mean and, and getting them down on paper and, and, and saying, this is, these are the things we're gonna need to do. And I think high impact teams, I think team building, 
um, where people are learning to learn from people who use drugs. We're learning from people that are in institutional settings. I mean, there's a wealth of information that you can share with our group that we don't know. And there are things that we can share with you that you don't know. And I think finding ways to build these teams, it is what has certainly made a difference in my life um, is having high impact teams. When I'm going somewhere and I have to answer questions about different things, I go to the people that I trust and we sit down and we talk about it. And yes, at the end of the day, I end up doing and, and sharing what I believe, but I have made informed choices and I have and I've made informed decisions because I have people that I trust in my team sharing with me, you know, the history of some things I may not know or, well, Louise, that's not how change is made in this in this sector. So that's probably not the best way to go about that. So I think those are the two big ones that I can think of that I can think of. Thanks, Louise. We've got about a minute left, so I'm going to go to Ray and then Jasmine, if you have any last words. Ray, what would what would your last message to be to this group today? Um, no, I definitely wanted to uh, bounce off Louise, too, with about the meaningful inclusion. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's more than just checking a box of um, yep. making sure you're having, you know, a team of equity to to really to make change together. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think just the, the final thought is um, thank you again for the opportunity to be here. And um, I really hope um, as each county um, and as these funds um, coming in um, that have potential to save so many lives that we mm -hmm. continue to not, not even just me and Luis, um, to have um, other uh, individuals um, with, the, with the lived experience to be at the table as well. Um, because, you know, people with lived experiences, we're not all the same. We have had different journeys. Yeah, there's maybe a lot of commonalities there. Um, but every voice needs to be heard. But thanks, thank Ray. You. Thanks, Ray. And that's such an important. Let's not let's not let one or two people speak for an entire group. Jasmine, last thoughts. Um, just briefly for you know for folks who may be in county government thinking about this, I would just say start with a first step. You mm -hmm. know, reach out to some, reach out and invite someone to get coffee or meet up for lunch who you know um, works in the field or has lived experience and just start the conversation there. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it, it, when work can grow out of relationships around this, I think it's so much stronger from the start. So if it feels intimidating to think about all of this at once, trying to find that sort of bite-sized piece, um, building from a basis of someone you have a connection with already um, and going in with an open heart and um, ready to do a lot of listening and learning and be humble um, mm -hmm. about, the, about uh, the learning we all need to do together. Yeah. Well, I want to thank Louise, Raymond, Jasmine, and also my colleague Allison for this. And we're gonna um, those are such wonderful messages to be reminded of. I, I like how Jasmine ended it on um, this can be so intimidating. Start with the things that we know, which is making those connections with an open heart, with humility and honesty. We're gonna turn it back over to Steve, who's gonna take us through a QA period. Thank you so much for that um, really inspiring panel. I particularly want to thank Ray and Louise for sharing your experiences and your wisdom. And, and you know, the thing that sticks in my mind is Louise's focus on high impact teams. Um, I would love to hope that the partnerships that we are working on to make the most of the settlement funds, I hope those will be a lot of high impact teams. Um, I love that phrase. And Louise, you and I will have to sit down and talk about uh, what that means in your work. Um, I am actually going to be assisted by um, Anna Stein and Alyssa Kitlis, who have been tracking the, both the Q&A and the chat. One preliminary note, so some folks have decided that this is a perfect time to cut down some trees right outside of my apartment. So if you hear big, loud crashing noises or things that sound like chainsaws, uh, don't be alarmed. But Anna and Alyssa. Okay, Steve. So um, first question, the, we've talked a lot about some of the great work happening in Western North Carolina on this, at this meeting. Um, what are some efforts that are happening in Eastern North Carolina? That is a great question. Um, let me actually maybe ask um, April first if she has any any thoughts on that from the perspective of a 
Western North Carolina funder. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Steve. Um, so I think what I would really speak to in response to this question is the power of philanthropy to, to really provide opportunities to braid funding and do public-private partnership. And we've been really lucky at Dogwood to, to work closely with the Department of Health and Human Services and to, and to really be able to sit down with them and talk through strategies, talk through their perspective across the state, um, what they're seeing that's working, and that's been a really just wonderful situation. And I, but I think what philanthropy can, you know, the, the, the funding stream has different attributes. It has different types of, you know, restrictions, uh, freedoms, that kind of thing. And I think I would really, the other, well, the other big piece that I think um, philanthrop philanthropic um, entities have can just bring so much value is just really even convening um, uh, organizations, counties, municipalities in areas to talk about this issue and to sort of just bring folks together. Um, so in addition to providing funding to help support planning, I just know that for our region, that's been a key part of the formula is philanthropy partnering with, um, with uh, public funding, uh, you know, as well as uh, other private funding that these counties have sought um, to support their work in this area. So that would be my first response. I appreciate that. And I actually, uh, Heather Murphy in the text notes the all of the work that has been done um, through the opioid response team at UNC Chapel Hill, which was funded by Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Carolina. Um, I think that there's also a number of communities throughout the state that have gotten the R Corp planning grants. Um, and but I, I, I got to have to be honest, this is not an area of expertise for me. And I would say to everyone on this call that I think we all need to be looking for opportunities to engage in meaningful planning, both sort of county-based, but ideally region-based. And so that would mean building on some of these efforts that have already been funded uh, through, through our core, through the Institute of, through Blue Cross and the Institute of Government. Um, I think also the, um, the Eastern and Western health networks may be helpful in coordinating some of this work. So um, WNC Health Network um, coordinates in, in uh, essentially the dogwood, um, the dogwood footprint, the efforts of counties to do their um, health needs and community health needs assessments, counties and health systems. And there's a similar effort covering much of Eastern North Carolina called Health ENC. So I think um, through your county health department, maybe talk to Health ENC about coordinating some of these efforts. And I think really all of us collectively need to be making a pitch to, um, to the General Assembly, um, which is gonna be getting 15% of these opioid settlement funds. To my mind, what a perfect use of that 15% to support planning efforts around the state, um, to DHHS and to um, both state, regional and local um, foundations. And candidly, given this is an 18 year funding stream, I mean, I, I would think outside the little the box a little bit about who might be willing to help convene some of this planning work and support some of this planning work. I mean, this is not just an issue of addressing um, addiction, and overdose and drug misuse. I mean, this is potentially something uh, when we talk about addressing the social determinants of health and supporting people in recovery through transportation and housing and employment. I mean, this can be seen, I think, really as an economic development issue. And so I don't have a simple answer to that question, but I would like to turn it back to everyone on this call to think about how we can get additional support for planning, because it's not often you have an 18 year funding stream like this. So thank you for that wonderful question. Okay, well, I'm gonna take a point of privilege as the questioner to, to try to add my own two cents about that. Um, there's a lot of great work happening in Eastern North Carolina. And I was trying to find in the chat, someone had posted the North Carolina Opioid Dashboard lists all the counties of the state and what activities they're already addressing. So, I don't know if Alyssa, you can throw that up in the chat again. So that would be like the last thing in the chat, but 
you can look and see what's happening right now in all of the counties. So that would be really helpful. Um, on the North Carolina Safer Syringe Initiative website, so if you Google North Carolina Safer Syringe Initiative, you can also see where all of the syringe service programs are in the state. And we do have um, syringe service programs in Eastern North Carolina. So those would be great um, organizations to partner with. The North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition is also active in Eastern North Carolina. Um, there's great um, lead initiatives, um, law enforcement, enforcement assisted diversion programs happening in Eastern North Carolina. So there's a lot of great work. Um, reach out to your health department um, to learn more. Reach out to the Injury Violence Prevention Branch to learn more. So there's a, there's a lot more that we can say about that. Um, but Steve, I wanna go into some questions um, about the nitty gritty of the settlement, like very technical questions. Hey, um, Anna, one, before you yeah. do that, let me just yeah. make a follow up on your point about the dashboard. So when you said that you can go to the, you said go to the opioid settlement dashboard, but actually. No, I'm sorry. Yes, it's the North Carolina opioid. Act it's the DHHS op opioid dashboard. That's what, so yeah, I said it wrong. Yeah. Um, and hopefully somebody from my it's team. In the chat. In the chat. Yeah. yeah. And, so you all go, go to that and, and yeah, I, thank right. you for correcting me, Steve. And, and for the audience, <laughs> we talked about a lot of different dashboards. So actually, let me <laughs> pause and say, first of all, on the agenda that you received today, at the bottom of the agenda are several links to the various dashboards that we've been talking about. There is really, you know, fundamentally before any of the settlement dashboards, there was the state, uh, really the bedrock strategic document here is the state opioid and substance use action plan and the state opioid dashboard from DHHS. And that's what Anna was saying. You can actually go and see what different counties are doing in terms of many of these strategies. So that's sort of number one. You'll also see at the bottom of the agenda that D that DOJ has a dashboard that deals with a lot of the nitty gritty, a lot of the legalities of the settlement. Um, in addition, you learned today about the statewide dashboard that UNC is putting together for the opioid settlement. Um, and I would also point you to, for questions about counties signing on to the settlement, you might wanna visit the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners dashboard and all of those links are at the bottom of the agenda. So sorry, but I, I just want, I, there, I imagine there is confusion about all these different dashboards and websites. Thanks, Dave. That's very sure. helpful. Yeah. Um, so the first question, how do you know if your county has signed on to the settlement? Great. So um, I think I need to clarify first that participating in these national opioid settlements is a two-step process. So step one um, is signing on to the state MOA. And most counties, I think close to 90 counties have signed on to the MOA. And we do expect all 100 counties um, to sign on to the MOA. We also have, I think the 30 largest municipalities have already signed on to the MOA. So there's tremendous enthusiasm um, uh, to, we have a link. If you go to the more powerful NC website that's linked at the bottom of your agenda and you click on opioid settlement and you click on MOA, um, we have some information there. And I the, also the map that will show you who is signed on to the MOA or not is, is on the county commissioner's website. It, which is also linked on our website. Um, the second step, which is signing on to the, the national settlement that funds the state MOA is going on right now. And there've been some delays in sort of the technology, but essentially notices have gone out to all of the counties and municipalities who can sign on. And so that part of it, signing on to the national settlement is, is ongoing. Okay, thanks. Um, can you walk us through a calculation of a sample county's share? How can somebody figure out what share their county will get? Yes. So here again, I would direct you to the More Powerful NC website. On the More Powerful NC website, there's the section about opioid settlements. And in the section about opioid settlements, um, 
they're either under the either under the part about the national settlement or the state MOA, there's actually a link to an Excel chart. And what the Excel chart says is for the hundred for each of the hundred counties and 17 municipalities that will be receiving funding, what is the maximum total amount that would be received over 18 years? Um, that's the best we can do right now because of some of the complexities about not knowing exactly how much money we're going to get under the settlement, but that will at least give you a ballpark. I mean, you can divide that by 18, um, and that would give you a notion of what would be coming into your county or municipality on an annual basis under the settlement. Okay, thanks. Um, can you explain what about the 5% incentive fund, what that is? Yes. So, um, I don't wanna go into too much detail, but under the MOA, the actual um, division of money was originally 15% um, to the state, 80% to the counties and the municipalities, the, the counties and the 17 municipalities, and 5% to um, an incentive fund. Um, Essentially, the, what the incentive fund ba basically said was, hey, counties, if you can get your large municipalities to sign on to the settlement, you can participate in this incentive fund. And so without getting too far into the weeds, what has essentially happened is that all of the counties that have municipalities over 30,000 have gotten all of those municipalities to sign on. And so essentially every county, essentially everyone gets to participate in the incentive fund, which makes it a wash. So for all intents and purposes, it is now accurate to say that 15% goes to the state and 85% goes to the counties and municipalities. And, and, and essentially the incentive fund just gets washed into that 85%. Okay, thanks, that's really helpful. Um, and what happens if a county doesn't spend all of its money in 18 years? Yeah, so actually let me address that year to year. Um, so when I was talking about the MOA in my opening presentation, I mentioned that there's a lot of flexibility as between option A, that list of strategies, and option B, that planning process. Um, and I mentioned that in a given year, say, you know, Alamance County, they could actually do either option A or option B or a combination of option A and B. And there's a similar flexibility with respect to the timing that opioid funds are spent. Um, basically, there's no requirement that Alamance County, for example, when they receive a certain amount of money in you know, the fiscal year that starts July 1st, 2022, they're not required to spend that amount during that fiscal year. It can stay in their special revenue fund and they can roll it over into the following year. And when you get to the end of 18 years, you, there's no actual requirement that, that you spend it in 18 years. You could roll it over into year 19 or year 20. And I believe I would have to check, but I believe the way the MOA is written that as long as you either receive money or spend money or hold money in your account, all of the reporting requirements apply to you. So even beyond 18, if you, rolled money into year 19, you would have to do all the reporting requirements in year 19, the annual financial report, the impact reports and so forth. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility there. Our belief is that the transparency in the settlement agreement and sort of the court of public opinion will encourage counties and municipalities to be thoughtful about what, not just how they spend the money, but when they spend the money. Um, I would ex I would expect, you know, there may be some funds rolling over to allow for the type of planning that Dogwood um, is encouraging, and many counties are doing, not just in the West but all over the state. But you know, think about a county where, after five years, they hadn't spent any of their opioid settlement funds. I, I don't think we need to put a requirement in. I think the court of public opinion is going to cause residents of that county to ask their commissioners why they haven't spent any of the settlement funds. So. I hope that answers that question. 
Okay, great. Um, so another question is, can settlement funds be used to purchase syringes and can settlement funds be used to purchase naloxone? Yes and yes. Um, okay, those are, the, yeah, let me just stop there. Yes and yes. Okay. Um, there was a question from Rachel Prandoni about how can funds be used to further resilience work in local communities and I know that can encompass a lot of different types of work. And Rachel, if you want to elaborate about particular types of resilience work that you have in mind, please do. Um, but I, I didn't want to, um, I just wanted to throw it out to the panelists too. If we don't hear more about what she has in mind, do you have thoughts about what types of resilience work um, could be done with these funds? Um, I. I might need to understand that question better. Uh, I mean, I, one thing that I'm really excited about in the option A strategies is the very broad range of um, recovery support options that are in there. I mean, in addition to evidence-based addiction treatment, particularly medication-assisted treatment, there's very broad language about supporting people in treatment and recovery, whether that means housing, employment, transportation, education, job services. Um, and so certainly in that respect, um, you know, I, I think those are all things that sort of encourage and support resilience. Um, I would be happy, um, I, and I'd be happy to have, if folks have um, questions, you know, that question in more detail or other questions, I, I'm happy to address those. If you put them in the chat, I know that um, um, Anna and her colleagues at DHHS are, are tracking all the questions and I'm, I'm happy to follow up on questions that we didn't have a chance to answer. Um, and one thing I do wanna mention is I have a very hard stop in about two minutes because I'm hosting a different meeting at noon. Um, Let me ask you one more technical question. Yes. Um, I'm reading it from Q&A. So for counties that were part of the initial lawsuit and worked with their lawyers to prepare documentation and impact statements, are they required to sign on to the settlement or are they automatically considered as part of the settlement? Um, all, everyone is required to formally, affirmatively sign on to the settlement. And the reason for that, so if you, you think I'm, I'm a county that, um, is a litigating county. The reason for that is the settlement is an alternative to litigation. So the first decision you made is I'm gonna file a lawsuit. And so that's the current status, you filed a lawsuit. Now, attorney general, now the states and the local governments um, all over the country, including your own attorneys have negotiated this big settlement. It shouldn't be automatic that you want to switch gears and you, I mean, you started off filing a lawsuit and now there's a settlement. It's your decision whether you want to stop litigating and participate in the settlement. Nobody can make that decision for you. And so while the settlement treats litigating and non-litigating counties um, equally, um, you know, wh whether you litigated or didn't litigate, you, you need, you, you are a sovereign entity, you know, well, I mean, it's complicated, but you're essentially for this, for all intents and purposes, a sovereign entity and you need, you, your county commissioners or your city council need to affirmatively make the decision as to whether to be part of the settlement. Thank you. And I think we're done with the Q and A portion of the day and I will turn it back over. Um, is it Amy on the agenda? Thanks, Steve. Yes, thank you to Steve for sure. And also to all of our other panelists and speakers today. We're really, really excited with such the great amount of information and rich insights that were shared today. Um, and so we really, really appreciate everyone's engagement and participation, both in the chat and listening and planning and all the different roles um, and multiple hats people are playing. Um, so just wanted to not understate the level of thanks there. Um, so. Uh, the, as a reminder, the meeting recording agenda and PowerPoint will be added to the OPDOC website within the next week. Um, so stay tuned for that. 
Um, and the link is there for which website it will be posted on. It's our DHHS um, overdose OPDEC website. And then our next OPDEC meeting will be on Friday, December 10th from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. And the focus will be on justice involved populations and related programs. And we'll have a segment related to brain injury as well. So thank you once again, and we're ending right on time.